world. I mean, I won the a world superbike round in the same year. I became the fastest round rider around the LMN TT. And I just thought, my God, this is beautiful. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It just it's too beautiful to race. Even though it didn't seem fun at six o'clock in the morning when you're getting dripped on by a cold stainless steel roof. And it was just the whole weekend was like that. I just felt like I could. I was on rails every session. I was fastest. So it was the three Americans <laughs> I had the beef with. Um, it's only because they were as fast as me, I guess, you know, that came out the last corner and went, Wah, boo, and he just came past. I'm a granddad now, yeah. Fastest granddad on two wheels, apparently. <laughs> Hello, welcome to Off Track, the Much Like a Racing Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Neal. I'm delighted to say, deep in the heart of Blackburn, in Logan Look in the Ribble Valley, ladies and gentlemen. The, but you get introduced as a four-time world champion, but I get it as seven. Both. Four and seven. <laughs> Four. I prefer seven. <laughs> Is it a hard fought for there? Well. <laughs> seven time world champion. Ladies and gentlemen, Carl Fogarty, MBE. Carl, welcome to Off Track. How thank are you? you? I'm all right. Yeah, not too bad. Yeah. Good. Yeah, okay. What a beautiful place. This yeah, is thank you. fantastic. We're sat in your little, uh, in, the, in the man cave bit That's of your right, beautiful yeah. house. And it's, uh, it's full of memorabilia looking back over the years. Yeah, there's a few photographs about from, uh, from throughout my career, I guess. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. It's good to. Just to look back at them all and uh, remind myself what I did. <laughs> <laughs> what's life entail for you now? What, what's Carl Fogarty's life like these days after racing? Um, pretty quiet, really. Pretty much retired in, in a lot of ways. Although I seem to be quite busy um, this year. I do, um, I'm do. a kind of ambassador for a Ducati Manchester group, uh, which I really enjoy doing. Uh, an ambassador for a bike show insurance company. And do a few chat shows, a few, a few appearances, uh, personal appearances. But... Um, yeah, generally just kind of just trying to stay fit and healthy and do a bit of mountain biking, a bit of fishing, a bit of, on the dirt bikes and enduro bikes when I get a chance. And uh, yeah, that's kind of thing. Nice just to sit back and relax and enjoy life and the, and the growing family as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm a granddad now. Yeah. Fastest granddad on two wheels, apparently. <laughs> um, yeah, it's great to have two little boys because we've always had girls in the family. Um, have two little boys, yeah, bring them up the right way, get on motorbikes <laughs> from two years old onwards. Uh, yeah, it's, it's all good. Life's, life's pretty good to me. It's evened up the numbers, <clears throat> hasn't it? You've had the petticoat government for the last 20 odd years and now bringing a couple of the boys in as well, which yeah. is fantastic to see. No, no, it's great. Yeah, I mean, it's good as well because when they start playing up, you can just give them back to their parents, sort of thing. <laughs> you know, so. um, but yeah, it's, um, it's all good. Yeah. Okay. I was looking back through on YouTube and looking back through the, through the things that I remember, and it, it has been an incredible career that you've had starting out before the TT on the production bikes, your dad bringing you into it. There's, there's podcasts that have been done where we go over the, the full career history. It's, um, it's well documented, and the books, of course, as well. But though, what are your best memories of those early days? Um, it was just kind of fun days, really. Sleeping in the back of the van, um, or even a caravan when we got a bit more money, and uh, my cousins who would help out. Um, just very much grassroots kind of racing. Um, at the time, you, you didn't really enjoy it because you wanted to get to what you, you thought you were, you were going to get. You know, I did anyway at a young age. I, I was convinced I was going to be world champion. I wanted to get there as quickly as possible. But so when you're sleeping in the back of a van with sort of drops of dew falling on your face, it, Six o'clock in the morning, uh, the cold, wet thruxton. It's, it's not, it's not, like, it's not like good. But when you look back, it's the, the times I kind of miss really when it was just uh, it was starting out and uh, it was just it was just kind of fun really. Uh, even though it didn't seem fun at six o'clock in the morning when you're getting dripped on by a cold stainless steel roof. But um, yeah, it was good. At, at what point did you know that the, the career path that you were going to follow was it just sheer determination or did you have a plan? Just determination, really. <clears throat> um, my plan was to be 250 world champion on Grand Prix bikes. Uh, and that looked good at one point when in, in 86, when I was, I was doing all sorts of good things on 250 in Britain. It was only my second year, second full season of racing. Um, and I was absolutely flying. I brought four lap records in four weekends running. And um, I would got a ride for the, the British Grand Prix. I had to beg for a ride, to be honest, because I wasn't, I was that young and a bit, a bit erratic, I guess. And, I had a bit of a talking to by the by the ACU stewards saying, look, you better not get in somebody, you know, Carlos Lovardo's way or Christian Saron's way or anything like that or whatever, knock somebody off, um, which is good them to show um, <laughs> enthousiastic, enthousiastic um, I don't know, towards me. Um, but 
Yeah, I, I'd, I'd raced and and the, the feast length of the British Grand Prix, which was kind of unheard of really for somebody like me back then. And um, I had offers I had to go with Chas Mortimer and, and uh, with the Silverstone Armstrong team into Grand Prix in '87. And then a week later, I was testing at Alton Park um, for the British next round of the British Championships there, and I was I was really keen to win win that next round of the British Championships in my home circuit, Alton Park. And I went to the testing on the Tuesday, and I, I put an old tire in a slick tire. I only just started using slick tire, and I found a slick tire, a rear slick tire that my dad had used and not used from when he had the RG five hundred and stuff, you know. And put that in, and the second lap, I just high sided coming out the. The double right, I can't remember the names of the, of the, of the corners coming up before you before Lodge Corner. The, True, the double right, um, on it, as it goes over a rise, a high side, and kind of went down and kind of got went to get up, and my legs kind of facing back that way, you know. And so that was that. It was a really bad break. Um, I was hospital for like nine weeks. Um, my feet were broke, it came out of the skin, everything. So, so that was that, really. That, the offers for to go to Grand Prix racing kind of sort of dried up then, you know, um, disappeared. So we um, we tried to, I got my, my sponsor at Appleby Glade, Dave Orton, and we bought a couple of Hondas. I was going to do the European Championship, but uh, quickly found out that I was struggling to get back on a 250 again, to be honest. I really was. And the, the leg had, 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 had suffered, my knee had suffered badly. I couldn't get the full movement to, in, in, on, to get, on, get on a 250 again. So... So then plans kind of got scuppered, really. I had like a year or two in the wilderness with injuries. I broke it again the year after. And um, so then I kind of went to the big bikes where I kind of should have been going anyway, really. Should have been thinking about that probably more than the 250s. Um, and, I, and when I got on one, I just felt really comfortable straight away on the bike. It's first time I've been comfortable for two years, two or three years with racing 250s. And I just took it like a ducks of water, really. And, so that was kind of my career going that way then with the Superbikes and the TTF One World Championship, which I won three times um, and the Alaman TT and stuff. So, um, so that was that was kind of it really. I was determined to be, you know, short circuit world champion on the big bikes and that would be Superbike as it was. One of my earliest memories of you is the Appleby Glade RC30. Yeah. And just as that, that that bike was kind of the bike to be on, wasn't it, at the time? And Brian Morrison was riding it, Hizzy was riding it um, a little bit later. But that was that was kind of the step that thrust Carl Fogarty into the eyes of sort of the, the British motorcycle racing public. Yeah, well, I jumped on the bike in '88, um, and I wanted uh, riding at eighty percent because I had this. Injury thing or hanging over me with my, my, my leg. I was advised not to race really in '88, and even thought, even doctor said, look, you, he never thought about retiring. I'm thinking, what? Get on about, you know, I'm going to be world champion, sort of thing, you know. Um, so I was riding at 80, percent and I ended up winning the TTF One World Championship. Really, um, I had some decent results in Britain, uh, seconds and thirds and stuff on at Cabell and on the British Championships. Um, but I was just, I was new to the bike and like I said, I'm not really riding that aggressively and determined. I was just kind of just steady away really. And I didn't fall off the bike all year and uh, ended up winning the TTF One World Championship. But um, winning, winning the Ulster Grand Prix, beating Joey and all the guys there, pretty much first time at the Ulster Grand Prix. And then, then followed up by winning in, in Italy and in Pagusa, and then which pretty much clinched me the World Championship. So. So that was that, that really. And then in the year after, I kind of got help from Honda Britain and uh, did, the, did the TT, won the TT and the production race and then won the TTF One World Championship again and did the odd World Super Bike Round. Uh, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was kind of the RC30 that was that helped me kind of get established and make my name. Even though it was not the easiest bike to ride, I was struggling with it really on, on, the, on the short circuits with the front end of the bike. The geometry of the bike was just... Didn't suit me at all. I used to be just rolling the front all the time. On some circuits, it's horrendous. Uh, and I got like down into the uh, thrucks and it was really bad. I really struggled with it, to be honest. It held me back from winning a lot of races, even though I was getting good results, finishing top three, and sometimes winning. I was still complaining that the front just rolling all the time, you know, and it, it got worse and worse. Uh, by 1990, I couldn't, I couldn't ride the bike at all, to be honest. In 1991, I was about the fourth year on the RC30. It was an old bike then. It was still the worst handling bike I've ever ridden. And I really struggled to, to do anything in Britain, really. And in the, in the TTF, in the World Superbike Championships, I ended up finishing, 
I think eighth in the world championship that year, uh, beating Fred Merkel, who were two time world champion on the same bike. So, but even that didn't really, you know, impress people really. You know, they thought, oh, he's struggling to ride. He's not like good, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, you know what? I'm better than all these guys than I am. I just need the right bike. And we had to go on, at the end of the day, I had to go and buy my own bike, really, which is a Ducati. And, uh, and yeah, I had no spare wheels, no spare anything, really, with it. And I ended up winning the second round of the championship at uh, Donington, which, again, that kind of set me up then for the rest of the year and, and, and for the year, years after, really. It just set you up for life, pretty much. After yeah, that, it did, that, yeah. That was, that was the move, wasn't it? Yeah. But, but when, you, when you talk about the, sort of the Ulster GP and, and the TT and things like that, that's the, the, to dabble in road racing, it, it was almost... A, not kind of the done thing at the time with the swap over because it was you were roads or you were short circuit. You came along, Hizzy came along. I know some of the boys had done it before, but the, the main winners were the regular roads guys like Joey and, and Robert. But to to book that trend a little bit, to go over there learning, what did you learn the Manx? 80, 85, yeah. 85 one, 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 you started there. One of the newcomers there in 85, yeah. What was the, the attraction <laughs> for the CT? Um, I was brought up with it, really, as a kid. Every year from being one year old to 15 year old, I would get you know, two weeks off school, which is great because I hated school, <laughs> and go and watch my dad at the TT. So I was, he finished second behind Joey in 77. Um, so that was me. I really wanted to win the TT badly. I wanted to tick that off, off the list um, before I moved on to, to, to the world championships on the short circuits. And uh, that's what I did, really. It was, it was, it was tough. Um, but yeah, I was the last person to do that. You know, um, people did it before me in the seventies and stuff. When when you, you, you kind of you know your Hillwoods and Agostinis and that. But since me, it's it's, it's mainly just your your road circuit specialists who aren't really that good on short circuits. To be honest, who almost in some ways failed short circuit racers that are at the TT in, in a cruel way of saying it. But um, you know, I, I was the last one that could go on and win world. I mean, I won the a world superbike round. In the same year, I became the fastest round ride around the Alamon TT in, in 1992. So, um, yeah, it's when I look back on my career, it's something I'm really proud of that I, I could do both. And uh, it, yeah, it was it was it was good. Really. The one thing that that fascinates me about the TT and everybody that I speak to who who's raced the TT, I have a fascination with the man who has a hand on the shoulder and that start that, that moving through to the start and just sitting on the top of Bray Hill, looking at St Ninian's Crossroads. What did you feel at the time? Because for me, I can feel that when I'm doing the PR for OMG Racing the last couple of seasons, we've been over there, I've experienced it, and it, it's electric. Yeah, I shit myself, to be honest. <laughs> um, yeah, you just are, because it's, it's so daunting, but really exciting. And, you know, um, at the same time, it's it's just a buzz. It's just nothing like it. In many, it when I did it, you used to have the early morning practice as well. Yeah. Which, it really made the TT for me, even though I hated it, getting up at like four o'clock in the morning waiting for it to come light and you're sat on, on the on the Glen Country Road and just waiting for the sun to come up and then getting the tap on the shoulder to go, it's setting it off. And it wasn't until you hit the bottom of Braille that you kind of walk up and realise where you were and what you were doing really. But uh, yeah, there was, um, they, were, they were, yeah, the times I really miss, to be honest, I really do. TT's a special place for me. I end up, I go back there most years to just be a part of it, to watch, but yeah, it's so many childhood memories there for me. It's, um, it's a special place, yeah. Of all the laps that you did at the TT, what's your, your best memory from your time on the island? Um, probably winning the senior in 1990 in the conditions that it was running, really, at the start. It was peeing down um, at the start. And I, I, I took a bit of a gamble, pushed hard. And I caught Steve up by 20 seconds by Kurt Michael. He, was 20, he set off 20 seconds in front of me. And he, he had enough. He didn't want to. He didn't want to know after that. And uh, but the race and it dried up, and I was just leading the race by so 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 far, like fifty seconds in front. I think I was coming down the last lap over the mountain. I was thinking I'm going to win the senior TT. You know, um, I'm just filling up and getting a bit emotional going down towards Craig Navarre. And I was like, come on, I've worked with Sally. You, you've, <laughs> you've got to get this thing over the line first. You know, but but that was a special a special time for me. Um, thinking. I've won the first big race early on in the week, first superbike race, and then the senior TT. And I thought then I would say goodbye to it then. I was like, you know, kind of that would be, I didn't think I'd ever go back after that. And obviously I did. I did go back um, for the one race and shared the bike with Joey, which I didn't feel right about, to be honest. 
in 91, um, which didn't go to plan. They had a problem with the bike during the race. It kept cutting out on me. I ended up finishing second behind Steve. Then went back again in 92. Um, kind of for money, really. As, 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 you know, I hate to admit that, but it's kind of true because I was... It was costing me a lot of money to run the World Superbike campaign on the Ducati, a privateer team I was, and a few little sponsors. Um, so I got like sort of 7,000 off the tourist board and seven grand off Yamaha, like 14 grand, which is quite a lot of money. Plus, you got your prize money as well to go to uh, do the TT in 92, the last one as it turned out for me. And uh, yeah, it was a bit of sweet, really, because I was leading the first Superbike race by 35 seconds. Just with just about a lap to go, and the gearbox went going into the bungalow, and that was it. The race was over. I was like heartbroken. To be honest, even today, I still still miss still any regrets I've got would be not winning that first superbike race at um, at the TT, where we were leading it for so you know so long, and we, it was such a big gap. And it would have stopped Honda winning ten in a row. It would have been Yamaha's first one for ten years or more. I think it was. And then obviously the, the senior then had that epic battle with Steve and he was on the super fast Norton and I was on the pretty much standard Yamaha 750 road bike and uh, I rode the wheels off the thing really. Led for two laps and then he led and then on the last lap I pulled a few seconds back on him which took the lap record to 123. Yeah. Uh, and he, he beat me by four seconds um, which is, it wasn't that bad. Uh, I could, Having become the fastest ever guy around there, I, I kind of said I'm faster than you now around here. You know. <laughs> um, that was a nice to walk away as as that, even though I just we'd lost the race by four seconds, which is hard to take. Um, hang on, let's get this. Yeah, no problem. Hello. No, I'm just a bit of interview. You just ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> I'll switch that off. No problem. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. Wife's important. <laughs> she said you want the Starbucks. I went, no. Who <laughs> <laughs> had a cup of tea? Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, that was that then, really. Yeah, I was, um, I was, yeah, moving on to the short circuits and, and the world championships. And uh, yeah, I was determined to be world champion, really was. And obviously, 92, whatever I rode in 92, it kind of turned to gold, really. I, I did everything. Uh, I, I rode the Grand Prix, British Grand Prix on a private Yamaha, running fifth on that um, with a few laps to go. And then I went down some coolant that John Krasinski had spilt. Um, won the Macau Grand Prix, just did, um, did some racing in Malaysia, won, won races out in Malaysia. Um, I, I just seemed to, whatever I did, it, it kind of worked out and rode the Ducati and World Super Bikes and had some decent results. Won in Donington, had second in Aston and did enough to get the the factory ride on, on, on the, the best team, the best bike in, in World Superbike in 93. And uh, yeah, um, that was it really. It's, it's been an impressive, that was the, those two years, 92, 93, were impressive years, especially from the, the Grand Prix point of view. Um, I was at Donington in 93. After the, the opening lap with, um, with Schwantz and Barros and, and mm. Dewan. And you were there all the way through on a, a Fairly unproven bike, the Kajiba. Well, it wasn't the most competitive bike you could have ridden, but it was up there and, and you made it work. It, yeah, it was all right. With the whole really. crowd behind you as yeah, well no, and, and um, Neil in fourth at that point. I didn't really get much practice on it at all. Um, I quite went out in, on practice day on, on the first day on Friday. I was trying to figure out this bike because I've been riding racing four strokes all year and I'm just going, wee, wee, just scream. I couldn't tell what gear I was in, you know. And I uh, came in, they're all clapping and looking up and like, well, I thought, looking for my name from eighth downwards. And well, I was second fastest behind yeah, the Swans Arena. As we all went to bed Friday night, I was second fastest. I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna, you know, um, I need to. And they said, look, just try and think about the bike in the morning with the, the gearbox, what you want to do. Because second bit low, we're third. I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. So we'll try that in the warm up. And the first half of the warm up, I wasn't concentrating looking back. and. Next thing, the thing sideways, and it threw me over the bars to come out of Melbourne Loop. So that was that warm up over with. And then we couldn't get the bike running. It, it found out it broke a wire or something and it wouldn't run properly for the, for the next, for the, the final qualifying. So they got a spur bike out, which felt terrible to ride. Awful. So I dropped from second fastest to fifth without really going any quicker. So I'd missed pretty much Saturday's qualifying. So it was just a case of guessing everything for Sunday, really. I had to leave the gearbox as it was. Guess on the rear tire, um, things like that. And so the race started, I didn't get a great start, but I made up time early on in, in, in the lap. And then obviously the incident 
um, going to Foggy's uh, is now. And then uh, I, I came out, I think, third or fourth. I went to second place and was gaining a little bit on Rainier for a lap or two. And then the, then the front brake, I started having problems with the front brake. I, I took my arm off and winding the front brake out. And then the Cadillac came past. And then the rear tire had gone. So I was like riding really, really hard on this thing. And then a lap, with a lap, lap to go, I held, I held off Neil. And it just kept surging a bit. And I just thought, oh, so with this thing now. And I came out of uh, the chicane, it misfired a bit. And then I came out of the, of the Melbourne loop. And I had like half a second gap on him. And, and it just went, blah, 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 blah. blah. And I thought, and I, I could see me like jumping on the bike, trying to get it into the last corner. As I came out the last corner, it went, what? And he just came past and took third. And that was, I was like, I'm all, I was I'm more devastated. I haven't won the British Grand Prix. I've had more practice on the bike. It, it could have easily, easily been a winning, winning the Grand Prix with the way it turned out, with, with the guys crashing on, on the first lap. Um, but it ended up, you know, I got robbed a third and ended up fourth, and, and that was it. But uh, yeah, I mean, I just jumped on the bike, and again, I could ride any kind of bike and any kind of circuit, maybe whether I've been riding, racing four strokes all year, and I could just switch to a two stroke and, and run. And we, we were the front guys, you know, I could do that. I was, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, it was good. <laughs> Why didn't the GP dream happen? I don't really know. I just think my face didn't really fit. I didn't probably help myself. I didn't push myself or promote myself in the right way. I'm looking back on it now. Um, I did have talks with Lucky Strike Suzuki a little bit, but they just wanted an American on the bike. And the same thing with Marlboro, Marlboro Yamaha with Roberts. Apparently he wanted me. I went for a meeting with him in at the last race of '95 at uh, in Barcelona. Uh, I forgot the name of the circuit now. What it's called? Um, Montmelo. No, what's it called? The circuit. But they raced now Grand Prix in Barcelona. At Catalonia. Catalonia. Yeah. Uh, I had a meeting with him there, and yeah, he kind of keen to have us for next year. But it says it depends on on what Marlborough want and stuff. And he kept. We hanging on for weeks and weeks. Now we're getting pressured from World Superbike teams like Honda and stuff to to uh, to make a decision. And then I got a call from I think it was Chuck Aslan, I think he's called Skip Aslan, yeah. whatever his name is, and saying, "Look, the Marlboro don't 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 want you on the bike. They want an American on the bike. So that's t your, your options in World Superbike. So so that's what I did. So I don't know how much truth was in that. I don't know. I, I don't know. I'll never know really. But the next thing it was Kenny Roberts' lad on the bike. So <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, a couple of years on that Yamaha, it would have been good for me, definitely. Because the Yamaha would have suited my style. Yeah. The, the Honda that I rode at the Grand Prix in 1990, I was just, it was like riding the RC30 again. The front was just horrendous on there. I couldn't let go of the brakes and run fast into the corners and carry my corner speed. It was just rolling everywhere. And, and I, I crashed it at the Grand Prix on at McLean's with the front rolling. I couldn't stop it. Um, and in other circuits, it would be fine. Um, but the Yamaha just seemed to just work really good. Like the Kajiv, that worked really good for me. That I could the European style of riding the bike you could, you could get away with, and uh, the Yamaha would have been good. For, definitely, I would have you know, won races on that and maybe challenged the World Championship. <clears throat> definitely in sort of '96, '97, I've had two years on that bike. It would have been, it would have been good, but it didn't happen. And the World Superbike became so big, so popular, um, that it didn't seem to matter at the time. Really, it didn't seem to matter at all. In this country, no one was interested in Grand Prix. It was like 13, 14,000, I think, at Donington. There was seventy thousand. In the World Superbike round there, uh, it was just crazy, and it, even in other countries, it was it was seen as a bigger bigger option than, than GPs. To be fair, um, we're doing a gone and and before kind of Rossi had, had come onto the scene and uh, and that. So, um, but yeah, it just it just didn't work out, and yeah, it's, it would have been nice to have had them a few years on on the Yamaha. It would have been good, but uh, no, it wasn't to be. You feel that everything happens for a reason? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. When the old planets align and one door closes, another one opens, and then the career that, that you took off with then on the on the World Superbike stage was was phenomenal. Bringing uh, the nine one six in, so you've ridden some amazing bikes across the years, and the nine one six was just something special. Tell me, when when you first saw it, when you first went over to Ducati, and you sat on it and you, you got your first look, what do you think? I just thought, my God, this is beautiful. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It just—it's too beautiful to race. I'm fighting falling off the bike and 
for making a mess of it. And I did at uh, my first <laughs> my first go on it at Donington, the British Superbike round. A bit, a bit, the weather was terrible; it was freezing cold. And I looked at the bike, and it was just a stunning bike. It really was. Um, and I crashed going down Crane of Curves, and I was like, oh, I was so apologetic to the guys who hadn't got, they hadn't got many spurs to repair it and stuff anyway, because it just bought it from the factory. And uh, I, went, I went on to win both races uh, on the on the Sunday, and oh, that was his debut, really. It's um, the British Superbike round at Donington. We used it as a bit of a test for the World Superbike round there. But initially, when I first rode the bike, I, 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 I didn't really like it. it. was It felt nervous, it felt short, and it felt twitchy, you know. I was on the 888. It was a longer bike, I could carry yeah. corner speed on that better, you know. Uh, and for the first few rounds, I was really complaining that I couldn't really get on the gas, you know, sort of mid-corner, run, run through the corner speed. It was just it was just twitchy and, and nervous. Um, and then we lengthened the bike. Um, I, I, I tested in Mugello after, after, um, after Albacete. I won both races in Albacete. I broke my wrist in the second round and that's a just right race really hampered with a, a cast on me on my arm but um at Mazzano and, and was running fifth and then the gearbox went because I was not using the clutch proper in the first race and I finished fifth <clears throat> in the second race went to um went to Albacete which is a little gold kart track and the bike seemed great around there I won both races and pulled the lead back and then we went testing then in Mugello and I was going around testing testing on on the bikes that I've been racing at the World Superbike Championship that year and I was, couldn't get out of 57s and they, they, then they get wheeled this the factory bike out the, the workshop kind of bike so they try this one I went boom boom 55 55 straight away I went oh, you know, I said, I've got to have this bike for the next round he says oh you'll have it don't worry it's the length in the rear swing arm altered the, the fork rate put it out um, so it just made it a lot a lot easier um, to carry and cornered really well and, it was changing direction good and everything. It was holding the line really well. So, yeah, I had the next, that for the next race and won both races there in Austria and, and carried on, really. At what point did you know in 94 in you were going to be world champion? Well, it wasn't until I crossed the line in Australia um, because so many things had happened that year. We had a reliability reliability issues <laughs> with the engines and stuff, with the crankcases and that. We were trying to couple engines together to get me through Japan and Indonesia. And I broke down in, in Indonesia by leading the race by six or seven seconds, with about six or seven laps to go. And it was actually the, the race that James Whitton won. I was reminding him that he only won because I broke down while leading. He's won. Um, yeah. Um, so, but um, yeah, I just kept making it. No, it seemed like no one wanted to win the championship that year. Then I went to Donington. I qualified on pole position. It rained. We put, I went for a hard Rio wet, which was just horrendous. I might as well have had a slick tire on, just terrible. I finished 15th or something, I got a point. And then the second race, I finished fifth, I think it was, on a, on a, a proper rear tire. And then, so Ross Scott had, had closed a lot of the points back. So it went down to the last round of the championship, really. I thought, God, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. It's just, it's just focus on, 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 on qualifying on, 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 on Friday and getting the bike set up, you know, forget about what the other's doing, just get the race pace good and stuff. And, we did that and the race came and uh, yeah, I just controlled the race, first race and won it. And that had me kind of one hand on the trophy. And then the second race, I just kind of followed Scott around, just had to follow him around and he pulled over, with, waved me on sort of thing. Cause he, he, I don't know what he was doing, but you know, um, if I, I'd have broke down the needle in the world championship, but he just kind of threw the towel in and came in sort of thing. Um, so that was it, across the line and won the World Championship at the very last round in the last race of the year, the other side of the world. And it was just you know, the emotions and, and relief because I should have won it a year before. It just, just, just came out, just in floods of tears, you know, it was just so emotional. It was, uh, yeah, it was amazing. It really was, yeah. 30 years ago, it is now. Makes Which you, is ridiculous, mm. isn't it? Our time, like, for me, it's it's 10 or 15, maybe 20 tops. <laughs> then you look at it now and it's 30 and we're, mm. we're, we're sat here in both over 50 and you think, hang on a minute, mm. <laughs> where's this time going? Yeah, it right. doesn't right. slow down, does no. it? When you went abroad and you you were traveling the world doing like the world super bikes and here, there and everywhere, having Michaela by your side, how important was that? Yeah, it was really important, really. Um, yeah, you need someone there to share the good times and more importantly, the, the shoulders to cry on when things aren't going well with the injuries. Uh, bad results, that kind of thing. She was 
like a rock really, to be honest. It was always always there, always doing the timing on little pit walls. Always wanted to be involved with it. If she was there, she didn't want to be just doing nothing. So yeah, she was really important, to be honest. Really, really important, definitely. It's nice to sit because you see these days it's not quite the same way, the same dynamic. I know racing's changed a lot since those days, but that relationship, it was it was Foggy and Michaela. She was almost she was becoming um kind of prominent in her own right as well. Yeah. Which was great working alongside you. And I'm a big fan of um, of teamwork in terms of partners and wives and things like that. And I think it, it's it's underestimated in how important it is. Yeah, it's, it, it was really important. You know, we had the kids as well, so she had them to look after, you know, because obviously at the races, my, my, my man was switched onto, <clears throat> onto the race and, and, and that was all really, but she had the kids. Um, and me, I was the biggest kid of them all. Uh, yeah, because I mean, are easy to deal with, though. You're not difficult. I mean, I was because I just wanted to win so badly that I know I sort of took the racing home with me all, all the time. I was thinking about the next race, even if I'd, I'd won. It was just that five minutes of like relaxing, and smiling, and the glory when you're on that rostrum and you're spraying the champagne. And then as soon as I come off that, it was like, right, the next race, where, where are we at? Ooh, at Mizan, I struggled a bit last year. Not last year, though. I need to do this. Need to. I would just take it on with me. I couldn't really switch off. And if I had a bad result, it was even worse, obviously. He wanted to get to the next race and, and put, that, put that right. So she had a lot to put up with, to be fair. A lot to put up with, with back home. Because I, I never really switched off from, from being a racer and, and thinking about the next race all the time. Did you do that with the World Championship as well? How do I retain this next season? You go race to race. When you, you've won the World Championship at the end of 94. And you think, right. How do we do it again in 95? Does that become the immediate goal? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, wanting to retain it because there's only one, one way to go after you've won it and that's, you know, to go down. So I didn't like the sound of that. So I wanted to to hold on to it. And I, I you know, I felt like we, that we'd, we would do, I think the bike, would be, the bike was its best it's been in in, the, in 95. It was a year old. It would ironed out all the little teething problems that we, with the bike in its first year. And uh, really, reliability, <laughs> reliability, reliability. <laughs> I got a lot better in in '95. I think I finished every race with the bike. I'm sure I did. Um, yeah, and I, I just come out of the blocks, flying out of the blocks, and won both races in Germany, and, and uh, dominated the whole year. Really, to be fair, yeah, um, yeah. So, what prompted then the move to Honda? <sighs> Stupid. Um, I think it was just Neil talks with kept. Pestrum and the, the team looked really good, looked really professional. Was ours wasn't that it was a bit disorganized, and you know, um, and I kept seeing the Honda. And you, you got a car, you got a free motocross bike, and the money was better, and that kind. Of, and I just thought, yes, I knew the bike was fast because I'd been racing against it, obviously. And so I just, I decided, yeah, I, I, I don't know whether this is more money or, or just the professionalism. It was based in the UK, the team. And I, I don't really know. I, if I had my time again, I would I would never have done it because I should never have broke up a winning team. I had everything right: the team, the bike, um, the package. Everything was brilliant. And to just you know tear all that up and, and go and start new somewhere, it was just uh, it was just crazy, really. Um, and um, even when I went to Honda, I thought, well, I probably won't win the championship this year. And I even I remember even thinking that way, which is not like me at all at the beginning of the year. I'm going to probably top, finish top five and win a few races. That's pretty much what I did, even though as I went round to the last race of the year, I could still win the championship mathematically. You know, as four of us could win it, and I came out fourth of the, of the four. Um, but yeah, I just never give up. I don't know. Maybe I took a text from responsibility to myself, really. I didn't really fully give 100% a lot of time with Honda because I knew that the bike didn't really suit me. I couldn't really carry the corner speed, mid corner, with breaking traction all the time. The team didn't seem that helpful in, in, in a way. Um, and I gave up a little bit on it because I, I knew I was going to go back to Ducati and, knew, and they would have me back, which is gr great of them, to be fair. It really was. And, but when I went back, it, it, things had changed. Engine guys had gone, suspension guys had gone, um, and I felt like this bike was really difficult to ride. It wasn't like my 95 bike. It was, it was sharp and it was in the corners. It was, I couldn't get off the bike in the corners and I couldn't figure out why. And the style, you know, look at the pictures. 97, I was really like, like the frog sort of legged on the bike, you know. And it wasn't until a year later after that that they realized that the tank had been a, a bigger tank on the bike, you know. So I couldn't get off it like I could in 95. I could get right off the bike either side. And 
the biggest, bigger tank. I couldn't do that. So, and it was, went to the one injector system and that was snappy and sending me out wide in, in the middle of the corners. And I was complaining about it all year. And, but I was leading the World Championship for most of the, most of the year, really. Um, but I could feel that it's slipping a little bit with the Honda and Kuczynski getting stronger. And we were getting weaker on, on the Ducati and couldn't figure out why. And couldn't it? Virginia, he was more concerned about how the bike looked and rather than sorting the issues out that they had and uh, ended up losing the World Championship um, to Kuczynski. And then um, I, I got it back in 98, but again, it was, it was I thought I was riding hot, riding more aggressively, more determinedly and, and, and better in 97, but with, with the Packers, it wasn't really right under me. And in 98, I kind of lost my motivation a little bit, lost my way a little bit, to be fair. Um, didn't win that many races. My consistency was bad. But then for me, the other guys were pretty much the same, really. Um, and I, I got a bit of a talking to by David in the Laguna Seca, just saying, look, you know, stop wasting our time. You complain about this, complain about it. It's you. If you want to win, you can win. You, you show your, your determination and stop you're wasting our time. If you want to stay at home next year, stay at home. And, and retire, whatever, you know, like, fuck it, I'll show you, you know. And um, I put a run together in, in, in the last part of the year, which clinched me the World Championship, you know, and I was kind of lucky in a way uh, to win it. Um, but, um, you know, the other guys were as inconsistent as I was, and they were like Slight, Edwards, uh, Corsa, Killy, Harger, all could have won it with a few rounds to go. And I came out on top, and you know, I was a bit lucky in some ways. Um, but in 99, my head was right then. The bike was, was we sorted the problems out with the bike. We got it almost back, back like to my 95 bike with, with the tank and stuff. And uh, I just thought, I'll show you all in 99. I was really determined, really focused and uh, came out of the block straight away. Went bang, bang. There's a double win for you straight away in, in Kyle Army. It dominated and cleared off in both races. And uh, kind of, you know, pretty much set up the year like, like it did in 95, really. I dominated the whole year and, and was really strong and really consistent. And uh, yeah, I, I knew that in 98, people thought I was a bit lucky. I knew in 99, that, well, the people think, oh, he's good again. He's really good. He's determined and he's, he's won that third and square. And he beat us all by, by a mile, to be fair. So yeah, that was it. Which, which of the four World Superbike titles gives you the most satisfaction? I think the first one, really, because it's that first one you've won. You can't ever take that away. Uh, and the way it was, it was like 94 and like 98, very similar. I was in 95 and 99. I was, I'd, I'd wrapped the championship up early in 95 and, and 99. Then 94, it was down to the very last race of the year. It was the side of the world, Japan, 98, Australia, 94. But I think Australia, because I'd, I'd come close to winning it in 93. I should have done it in 93, but I was just a bit erratic and crashed a few too many times whilst leading in leading positions in, in the races um so 94 just shades it for sure and, uh, but probably 98 i guess when you look back and you look at other, the, the the lads that you've ridden against and so as you mentioned there and you your courses your hargers your edwards your keelys your slights so many great names in world Superbike. you sit at the top of that with four world titles who was your strongest adversary at that time who's your strongest rival but who did you get on with most i didn't get on with any of them to be honest i didn't i didn't like any of them i didn't they didn't like me it was kind of it was a bit like that really certainly through the press and stuff it was like that um but although we kind of used to have a beer and pizza and stuff on a sunday night a lot of times um so maybe it wasn't that bad it was all done for the press i think really um i think russell really was probably the one and then maybe Kaczynski. I don't really know. I can't really separate them, to be fair. And Edwards, Edwards as well. So it was the three Americans <laughs> I had the beef with. Um, it's only because they were as fast as me, I guess, you know, that I, I kind of wanted to get in their heads, maybe, or diss them and, and whatever, say what I said. But I kind of wish I'd never said it, really. I wish I'd just focus on <laughs> on doing, like, Max and speak louder than words, and which I did. But I, I'd rather just took a lot less pressure off myself by saying I'm this, I'm that, I'm blah, blah, blah. And, and just, you know, just gone out and done it rather than having to like diss the others and say things about them. I don't know why I did that. I look back on it, kind of say I regret it, but I shouldn't have done it really. Um, but it was just, I think how I was, my makeup, it's, it's how I was. It's what made me who I was and made me win what I did. I, I was that, I had to be like that, I guess. I had to say those things to, to make me 
sort of stronger and, and, and put pressure on me to win and stuff, I think, more than more than anything. I think it endeared the crowds here, though, as well, didn't it? Because oh, yeah. it, it built that rivalry up. When you look back at Brands Hatch and the 120,000 people that turn up there to, to watch you and the wild cards race, but there's so many foggy flags and foggy oh, yeah, t-shirts and the nice. eyes and everything yeah. else. They're, they're just the heyday of, of world superbike racing. Yeah, it was mad. Brands was just incredible. It really was. Um, it didn't always go that well for me at Brands, to be fair. Um, but the, yeah, the crowd of in 99, because I'd, I'd won the world champion. I was a reigning world champion from 98, which um, was obviously why they came out. And I was leading the world championship in 99. So I, I predicted, I remember predicting, I said, look, there's going to be 125,000 here. At Brands, hope you're ready for that. I remember saying to the MCN on my column I did weeks before, and I don't think people believe me, but it was 121,000. But there's people climbing over the fences and under the fences and stuff, so it's probably probably 125. Um, it was just madness, absolute madness. And just like it was just a sea of red, just the foggy flags and t shirts. It was just unbelievable. And I, I got distracted that weekend doing interviews. I even doing, I even, I even mic'd up at one point, commentating in, in the warm up. Instead of focusing on getting the right rear tire, because I didn't, I didn't, we didn't get it. And I qualified in pole position. I don't know how. I just threw in this lap that was just absolutely unbelievable. I was just all over the place. I almost crashed at every corner, almost losing the front at every corner, just on the limit everywhere. I took pole position. And uh, I remember in a press conference after, and Edwards and Slack, they were really confident. And David said to me, he said, we're not right for tomorrow. You're not right. We don't know what we're doing. I said, yeah, I know. So we'll just do what they do. We'll just go for the same rear tire as what they're using then. And uh, it didn't work. It just, I don't know, they're using more power on, the, on Ducati or whatever it was. It just didn't work at all. And uh, it, as I came out the, the left, up to the last corner, over the left's cold, I don't know. Um, Sterling's. It, Sterling's. It, it just went. <laughs> the real art just, was just falling apart, and I just come straight into the pits. And, well, it was just a, a comedy of errors that after, after that, what happened to try and change the rear, <laughs> rear wheel, and get me back out on the track. And it got me back out, and I, I think I finished 19th. And I was, I was distraught. I'd let, I felt I'd let everybody down, you know. So for the second race, it was like, what do we do? I said, look, you're going to have to run a 16.5 rear tire because the heat is just killing you. Um, you can't, the 17 inch, which I was, I love the 17 inch rear tire. I really did. It was really good for me. Although it run hot, it run really hot, the 17. And that did, it won't risk a blister and things like that. Um, you can't run it. You have to run 16.5, which didn't give me the grip that I wanted mid corner. It wasn't good at all. So I, I struggled with that and but finished fourth. And uh, I was just like distraught, to be honest. I really was. I thought well, I could let everybody down, even though I hadn't. It was just, you know, they wanted to see me, the world champion, yeah. the, the guy that's leading the world champion. You know, they wanted to see, if I had won, it with a bonus, but they just wanted to see me race, I guess. And, you know, I, I couldn't wait to get out of there. I just jumped in a helicopter and got out. I was, I was home in Blackburn, sat outside having a beer. But, uh, I don't know, about six o'clock at night, seven o'clock, I just flew home. I was just, that was, and I remember t saying, my mate who flew, I said, oh, I'm going to Ibiza for a few, few for a week. You want to come with us? I'm like, I, w I wanted to punish myself and say, look, no, I'm not going. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking about the next race now, which was four weeks off, four or five weeks for the next race. I ended up going to Ibiza with Mikhail and my mates and yeah, just trying to forget about it and chill out for a week. So, yeah. All the races you did in World Superbike. And I've seen some over the, over the years, as, as, as we all have. And then doing a little bit of the, of the research over the last couple of days. Which is the, the one single race for you that sticks out the most? Um, Brands Arch in 95. It really is. I'd never won a race there at Brands Arch at any level. And I came into Brands Arch in 95 having not really been out of the top two all, all year, apart from Laguna Seca, where I really struggled, which is the week before. Brands Arch, and I thought, oh my God, Laguna Seca, it's a lot like Brands, up and down, up and down. I'd had a nightmare at Laguna, I couldn't get on with that track at all, fifth and seventh, I think it was. So I thought I was going to really struggle. And for the first set, practice session, I was out, just steady away, and I come in on top of the screen, thought, but you know, I'll even try it. And it was just, the whole weekend was like that. I just felt like I could, I was on rails. Every session I was fastest. 
And then on Sunday morning, I opened the curtains and saw this crowd. I just thought, even now I get goosebumps. It just, it just flew us full in 95. It was like 50, 60,000 there in, 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 that, in that other area. And, uh, and it was just a red-hot day, and I'd just won both races. I could speed up and slow down wherever I wanted to, really. It was just what I called the most perfect day, where I'd set the fastest laps. Uh, won both races and on a circuit I'd never won on before uh, in front of a crowd that hadn't been seen since the mid 70s since the days of Barry um, it was just unbelievable so that that for me was just yeah a special day yeah, definitely. how did you deal with the press and everything that came with it because as a as a just as a regular lad from Blackburn mm. just wanting to ride his bikes yeah. and, and win how do you deal with the press coverage because that just became nuts and all the coverage and the fans and everything else um, yeah, I, I just did, didn't I? I just did, really. I wasn't, I wasn't ever that comfortable with it. I, I, was, I was never great with the TV and stuff and, and, and interviews and that, but I just, I somehow just did. I don't know. It, it got worse and worse. That, and by 1999, it was, you know, even 95, it was, the Sun newspaper would follow every race, come to every race and, and do a story on it and that. And, and TV and stuff. Um, but yeah, I just, um, I just did. I just seemed to, I just seemed to cope with it, really. Um, it wasn't that bad, to be fair. Uh, it was all right, <laughs> I think. I can't remember now. <laughs> I was going to ask if you miss it, but you got this, this, this beautiful life up here on the hill. No, nice and quiet. And I don't just... miss it. No, I don't really. No, I think because my body now hurts from, from the injuries I picked up in my early 20s. It, it, my, it hurts. And to think about getting on a bike now, it fills me with, with dread because my body hurt, hurts from my leg hurts and my knee and stuff and my ankle. Um, so... I, I, that's the reason why I don't miss it. I think if I felt if I felt really fully fit and healthy, then I probably I probably would miss it. But I think I did for the first few years when I it happened when I, when I announced my retirement, it was relief for me. I felt like oh my god, the biggest weight in, in the world been lifted from my shoulders. All this pressure on to go out and win, the expectation for me to win from the press, the media, the fans was all gone. And I remember when I announced it, it was on the twenty first of September. 2000 and it was going across this, the sky in four bar on the bottom and the fax machine was going it was on the radio i was like oh my god i didn't think anybody really cared i didn't, I didn't really realize i that well known you know i, I didn't know <laughs> i'm going down to london in 2000 2001 i was getting recognized all the time everywhere i went i thought this is mad i didn't realize this this, this would be the case you know um so yeah uh I what i was saying Anyway, what about the adulating missing? Yeah, um, so I didn't, I didn't really, I missed it in them first early years when I, but I didn't add the, then add the Patronus thing to, to run, and I wasn't really in a good place for that really. I was still raw from not being able to race motorbikes anymore. But initially, I didn't miss it. Is what I'm trying to, what, what I was meant to yeah. say. It was everybody else that kind of, oh my god, it's, it's it's over sort of thing. And for me, it was like relief that I hadn't been, got to be that number one again. You know. Uh, so that was that was the way I felt, really. The lads following you through, you got the, there's the the East Lanks sort of rivalry with Neil. He was coming through the ranks at the time, and I think he went a little bit too much too soon when he was on the factory Ducati before he stepped back to BSB. But then Neil coming through and JT, there was there was almost the the after foggy time of those two. What do you think of those two, right, as they were coming through, both world champions in their own right, but. Did, did you kind of miss racing alongside them and, and trying to beat them and prove who was number one? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I'd have easy beating them both. Um, I did beat them both. Um, no, I mean, yeah, they, 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 yeah they're sort of diff different kind of careers in some ways. Neil had his shot at um, World Superbike. It didn't kind of work out for him. Came back to Britain and then won the championship. Um, and then went back to World Superbike. And it was in, in the year when World Superbike kind of took a big downward sort of... It was hit hard with MotoGP when that went to four strokes. And then the top three guys from World Superbike pulled out. The top couple of top teams, um, I think Aprilia pulled out and maybe Yamaha did as well. And then that was the Ducati sort of championship, really. Then in 2003, we just kneel against... Um, his teammate who would win um, was Zaus, and he came out on top and more consistent than, than Zaus was. But no, I don't really think about you know them at all, really, as, as 
they, they went on to be world champions and, and fair, fair play to them. You know, they both rode well in, in the years that they, they, they were, you know, um, even though it probably wasn't as competitive as, as when I was winning. Um, but no, they, they can only beat who's out there. And, 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 and that's it. They did that. So, um, you know, fair play to them. With the foggy Patronus that you went on to, if that option, if, if you were to take that time again, would you make the same decision? I would probably be more involved in it, really. I'd probably be more responsible for for our stuff, really. I was. I, I didn't really understand it what I was what I was given. I, I ended up employing people to, to to do that, really, to run the team, to be a team manager and team coordinator. And I just kind of just sat back a little bit. I obviously chose the riders, um, went along to the races, ninety percent of them. But yeah, I would probably do it differently. I'd probably be a bit more involved, to be honest, than what I was. Um, yeah, I think so, yeah. Do you have any inkling to get involved in racing again? No, not at all, no. I thought that might be that. I thought I'd ask the question, but I figured that'd be that, yeah, because you would have done it. If you, if you were going to do it, you'd have done it already. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the only one I, I would I would have considered it in, in recent years, in over the last 10 years maybe, would be just the British Super Bike Championships. I think, for me, I just... I just want to be in my own bed on a Sunday night. I don't, traveling around the world doesn't doesn't excite me at all. It just fills me with dread, the airports and stuff like that. I can't stand it. Um, but no, um, the opportunity hasn't come and it, it, I don't expect it to. And it, if it did now, I wouldn't do it, to be honest. No, I definitely wouldn't do it. I wouldn't really know what, I wouldn't know where to start. <laughs> Bikes have changed now, aren't they? Yeah. Things, things yeah. have changed. Things yeah. have moved on. Yeah, you you don't follow BSB, MotoGP and Worlds? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I follow them all. Yeah, I follow all three of them, yeah. I think of the three, I kind of prefer BSB, to be fair. I just the nature of of the circuits that they race on, and the the horsepower of the bikes that they're they're running on these circuits, um, and it, it's it's so close for you, sort of twelve, fifteen guys for, for the podiums. Uh, it's a, it's just great to watch. It really is. Um, yeah, it's, it's mad. It's just madness. From how you ran your career and your determination and and the the the, uh, the mental aspect of it, what do you make of Tommy and Glenn this year? Yeah, it was it was yeah, it was good. Um it was competitive. Uh yeah, maybe maybe he overstepped the mark a little bit a couple of times. I don't know if maybe he'd been what they said, but then it was only like what I was like, you know. Um, so there's a lot of similarities between it. Yeah. I think there's a lot more hatred from, from me when I was out there. I think these two probably don't dislike each other as, as that much to be honest. They seem they seem all right really after the race and the stuff that seemed fine. Uh, he just got a little bit eaten at Alton Park, I think, really. I think with some of the comments Glenn come out with, which was a bit unfair, really, uh, about how he'd been brought up and stuff like that. And I just thought, well, where's he going with this? You know. I don't think even Glenn knew where he was no, going. He's with it, a bit it, stupid, really. I think he knew what he wanted to say, but the delivery was. Yeah, like, he kind of got he, it wrong. But then. <laughs> it didn't come across no. too well. And then obviously, we, Tommy smacking into him in <laughs> at Donington. That, that, that didn't go down too well. Um, but I'm 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 pleased Tommy won. To be honest, I'm yeah. really pleased he won. I think he deserved to he deserved to win it. I'm really pleased for him. Um, yeah, definitely. With family issues and stuff like that, I think it's, it's great that he's he's won it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the planets have aligned on that one, haven't they? It, yeah. We we spoke to Tommy earlier in the year down at um, down at Brands at the first round, and you just see a different side of him. And it, it's one of those where you think, Do you know what? Yeah, this is your moment. Will he get the chance again? Who knows? Yeah. Well, Glenn, you know he's going to be there and thereabouts. Yeah. He's one of the mo most consistent riders. But it'd be nice if uh, if one of them could let Glenn win it another time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's got, he's got the, all the tools for the job, hasn't he? Yeah, definitely. He, he, yeah, I mean they both be strong again next year. Are they, are they, all, are they both on the same bike next year? No, as far as I'm aware, PBM are retaining one, which I suspect is Glenn. And Tommy is looking elsewhere. Really? Mm. God, that's a shock. Didn't expect that one. Yeah. That, as, as far as I'm led to believe, yeah. One's re-signed, but one is still up in the air. Oh, okay. So, I, mean, I don't know whether the team want that same dynamic as what happened before. Yeah, it's, maybe not. It makes a stressful time for Jordan and Frank taking things over, obviously, after the, the sad loss of Paul, which yeah, is a, yeah. a big shock to the sport. Yeah, it was so sad. That was really sad. It's, um, it's, been, it's been a tough year for them. Um, of all the bikes you've ridden, which one was your favourite? The 916. Yeah, in 95, that was his second year of of, uh, of using it, and it was just 
the perfect bike really, really was. Just could make it do anything, just suited my style to, to a T. It was, it was brilliant. It was just fun to ride, race. So, with, so with, with, without sticking pins, what the fuck did you go behind? I don't know. <laughs> money, I guess. I don't know. I stupid. But you have to, but then again, you, it's a short career, isn't it? It wasn't just money, sometimes but, you, but it, sometimes I, you have got to look it at it. It just that. seemed like the grass is greener on the other side. And it, it's not always, and it wasn't. And I made a mistake. And, they took me back, even, but when I come back, it was things weren't no, quite the same. Quite you know? the same. No. The one over, overriding memory of the time on the Honda is, is Assen. When you look so over, you, you were always pumped to win, but that one just meant a little bit more. It felt. Yeah, I just felt like it when it came to that circuit, because I'd never been beaten on it, that I was still determined to to not be beaten on it. You know, <laughs> we won again, did a double again. You know, um, it was it was epic race. Yeah, it really was. Mm. It, it, it's been it's such an incredible career when you look. Um, and also, there's, there's the, um, the the Le Mans as well. You yeah, won Le Mans. won Le Mans. Won. I think people forget about that. Yeah, won all three uh, 24 hour races. I think the only person to do three and won, win three. <laughs> won all three races. 100% record, 100% record on record, endurance yeah. racing. On, uh, yeah, I think we won every race that year, if one, except uh, Suzuka. We won uh, the. the Six hour, eight hour race, wherever it was in Phillip Island, Australia. Did the same again in Malaysia, on the eight hour race there. And uh, yeah, won all three um, 24 hour races. I can't think of a rider that had such a varied career of doing GPs, doing endurance, doing world superbikes, doing British superbikes, doing the, the roads, doing Ulster, doing Scarborough. <laughs> yes, I love Scarborough. Did. I mean, that. Now, I've been up there a couple of three times. I mean, yeah. what was Scarborough like for you? Just, I loved it. I really loved nuts. Scarborough. I love, I love anti clockwise circuits, to be honest, um, which there aren't, there aren't many of. So. No, good point. Yeah, it's a, it's a left hander, isn't it? And uh, I just, just fly, I used to fly around there. Last time with we were 89, I won seven out of seven races. I borrowed a 350. I've stumbled, I don't even borrow it off now. I won both 350 races, won both 250, 250 races, and won three <laughs> Superbike races. Cross a Gold Cup thing. A super bike round, even the super bike back then, yeah. around Oliver's mouth. Yeah, it was, uh, it was good. Yeah, I loved it. I really loved it. I just felt like I could really ride hard around there, but I always felt safe. Yeah, I just you know, did. This is quite impressive to feel safer <laughs> around there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't see the dangers of more so. I didn't even see the danger of the TT. You, to be you can't, can you? To do that. If you did, you wouldn't do it. No, that's right. Um, but yeah, it was quite versatile, I guess. When you, when you read that lot um, from what I did, and, or any biker could just jump on. Sort of make it, you know, run up front on it. Yeah. I'm not even practicing much on it or seeing it. Um, yeah, I could, I could always be, be confident of, of giving 100% and getting up in the top two or three. Some confidence. What, what was your biggest fear? Losing. <laughs> 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 not being able to win, losing. That was always my biggest fear, losing. Yeah, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't, didn't go down well. So I was born on the first, for God's sake. So <laughs> um, I have to be first, even whatever I do now, whether it's Playing dominoes, the playing pool, <laughs> after win, terrible. I guess Michaela's led. She's to the same. She's, she, she's the same as me. She's really competitive. <laughs> I'm playing tennis because she's better than me. Oh, well, yeah. Last time I played, she, she beat me, but um, I can't stand it. But she had a lot of lessons and stuff, so she plays properly. I, I'm like <laughs> swatting flies, me. You know? um, but yeah, she's um, she's very competitive. Yeah. Tell me one thing about Carl Fogarty that nobody else knows. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. He plays dominoes. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I really don't know. Damn it. Uh, let's have a look. Tell me one thing that you wish you'd enjoyed more. Um, racing. I never, I didn't enjoy racing. Um, didn't enjoy racing motorbikes. Uh, I just did it because I, I knew I was good at it and it was as a job. I wanted to win. Um, I look back at People like James Whittam who really loved racing, I always had a smile on their face and always really positive. I was, I was, I was not. I didn't really enjoy it, you know. It's just um, so yeah. I wish I'd, uh, I'd been able to enjoy what I did more than what I did. Finding it hard to be in the moment to enjoy it because you're forever looking forwards mm. at the next. Yeah. What's next? Yeah. I find that with a few riders, it's, it's mm. difficult to to understand the moment that you're in because you are always driving forward the next mm. race, the next session everything that comes with it. What's the last entry on your Google search? Um, That's some proper random questions on these. 
where the tire company is, I wasn't sure. I've just had new tires put on my on my Carlos car. I couldn't remember where it was in Cluedo, so I've put in Harrison's tires, <laughs> um, Cluedo. So yeah, that, that's the one this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the most influential person in your life? Who's the most influential? Oh God, probably my wife. I guess. Yeah. It's kind of why I asked the question earlier on because the, the dynamic is so important. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. What annoys you most in life, Carl? Bad drivers, really bad drivers, at roundabouts, at junctions when they don't pull out and, and, and go when there's they need massive gaps. It drives me nuts. <laughs> Even when the lights change for amber, I go on amber when it changes from red. Amber go. Absolutely, yeah, you don't and wait for green. No, and they, they, some, they come, it goes on to green, and they're still like, I'm almost ready to get on the horn, and five <laughs> seconds later, they'll set off. I'm like, there's another five or six cars should have got through the lights if you hadn't have done that, you know. And it's just why traffic jams are all over the place now, is because they're really bad drivers. I can't stand it. I fully agree with you on that. Mm. But I'll tell you one thing that did was really satisfying this morning coming here on the ring road, coming up from the M65. All oh, right, you come that way, have you? Yeah. yeah. Every traffic light, green, all the way up the hill, uh, okay. over the top, you got lucky. and down to the bottom. I got mm. absolutely lucky on that. Mm. Yeah. What's the last time you changed your opinion on something or someone? Um, oh, I don't know. Good question. Oh, I think somebody in racing, maybe. <laughs> um, maybe I was wrong about him. and uh, Probably Bautista. Um, I didn't think he deserved to be on the Ducati after the way he, he, he went to Honda and didn't, didn't, didn't do anything. And for Ducati to re-sign him, I thought it was a big mistake. It really was a big mistake. How wrong I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've changed my opinion on him. He's, he's very he's very fast, very talented. The man-child on a missile. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's your most embarrassing moment over the years? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Probably shitting myself when I couldn't get to the toilet or something like that, I guess. I don't know. The loose motions and I couldn't quite get to the toilet. That's a bit embarrassing. That's yeah. the third time I've had that this week. Danny Buchan said it and Darren Fry said it as yeah. well. So if all you, a couple more questions. Of all you traveling over the world, what's the weirdest thing you've ever eaten? Uh. Camel's penis, cockroaches, mealworms, <laughs> deer's blood. <laughs> you don't get much weirder than that. There you go. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you're never going to top that, are you? No. Not in any way, shape, or form. No. Two final questions, and I would time, I'm keeping you for longer than I anticipated. That's all right. Um, you're in the van, seats laid back, stereos up to 11. What are you listening to? Oh, o Oasis. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Live Forever album or um, what's Story Morning Glory album that, that one was too. Yeah. The early ones. Yeah, first, first, first three, two, first, three, first three, yeah. three were really good. Even though the third one got a bit of slating, I thought it was brilliant. The third one really did. Yeah, it might, that takes you right back to to racing in the nineties. Really does. Anything of those that comes on takes me right back. Yeah, all the good times. Yeah. yeah. Uh, two final questions. Of all the circuits you've raced on, and there are so many, so this might take a little bit of time. What's your favourite corner and why? Um, I have to one at Assen, really. Assen, just, it just, maybe they even turn one at Assen, what I would call the, the old turn one. The old one. turn one, yeah. yeah. It just seems to just go in, let go of the brakes and like the banking of it, really pick up. The speed on the on the off the, off the brakes on the gas straight away, carrying loads of corner speed. It's just come out and he just just drifts, just slide it a little bit as it came out. And then you go over to the to the, the left hand side through a kink and then into the next kind of fast right. That kind of section there was just really all about carrying corner speed and flowing and uh, really smooth. Yeah, and it, was, it was properly cambered as well, wasn't it? Yeah, so it was, everything yeah. helped. It just helped me out with me carrying the corner speed that I did. I could carry even more acid because the banking helped. Yeah, it was great. And then the final question that I ask every new guest on the show, what's your best hire car story? 
<laughs> oh, I had car story. It was probably me and James Whitten when we had them in 1990, um, when we got some in Daytona. And we took these crash damage waiver things out on them and we just, just smashed it into each other the whole four or five days we were there, coming at junks and stuff like that, and just running, I'd run in the back of him. <laughs> and he'd have his windows down, and he's kind of neck like that. <laughs> Some bloke said, uh, hey man, he's just running in the back of you. He said, I, I know, he said, that's Daytona. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that would probably be, yeah, that would probably be just smash into each other the whole four days or five days we were there. Strangely enough, the, the Steve Parrish stories of Daytona, Jack Valentine's got stories of Daytona. Mm. Steve Parrish has got so many stories from so many different subjects, it's unbelievable. Well, one of the, one of the, the stories I had was talking to Roger Burnett and they were down in South Africa and they were shot at and <laughs> his parish was there waving his gun this guy was waving his gun so talking to Roger and, and obviously Roger Marshall as well was, they've all got some great stories of those times things are different now aren't they mm, definitely oh absolutely not yeah. for the better I no, don't think no they're not no. it was nothing like the good old days and that's 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 been the, the pure pleasure of, of sitting here chatting with you cheers thanks foggy thank you this no has been an absolute pleasure <laughs> Good. We, we'll uh, maybe do this again sometime, if yeah, you don't mind. Go a little bit of deeper dive and yeah. get some more stories going on. But for, <laughs> for the first time on, on Off Track, ladies and gentlemen, Carl Fogarty. Cheers, Carl. Cheers, Mike. Thanks.